good morning, my friends. Thank you. A little bit better there. Uh, concerning tonight, please come. If you didn't get the service announcement yesterday, we're going to have open mic. That means bring your favorite testimony, your favorite Bible reading, your favorite spirit of prophecy quote, and share it with us and why it's important to you. And bring your favorite song and your favorite music and sing it. Um, it doesn't matter. We want to have a good time tonight. And then we're going to go over the book of Jude. I'm telling you, the book of Jude, if you're about to lose your mind in today's world, literally lose your mind over things happening inside the church or outside the church, the book of Jude is for us. Just a little hint, it's nestled right beside the book of Revelation for a reason. We're going to go over Jude tonight. Just parts of it. We can't go over it all, but we're going to have a good time. Um, today is part two, uh, Attack of the Daily. Now, we're going to take some time to get to Daniel chapter 8 because I want to go back over something for a reason. There was so much to be said about the daily that can't be said enough. Just very fact of the of the name itself daily <laughs> suggests that we need to be talking about it more than just one small mention in a sermon. When I was in college at Southwestern, I dreaded the Greek class. I absolutely, totally dreaded the semesters that I was going to have to start taking and learning the Greek language. And I remember the first day of, of class, Elder Kilgore, he said, well, when we was in school, we called it Baby Greek. And I thought, baby Greek? He said, yeah, because it keeps you up all night. And he wasn't kidding. It literally kept you up all night. I mean, learning a new language in three semesters was not easy. All the different case endings, nominative, accusative, dative, genitive, singular, plural, voice, number, all the conjugations of your verbs, hundreds of paradigms. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens. I've had a stack of cards this thick that I carried everywhere I went for two years. Everywhere, every morning, every afternoon, every night. You could catch me somewhere on the job site, in the bedroom, somewhere going nominative singular, accusative singular, dative, genitive, possessive. I mean, just constantly over and over and over and over and over again. Because every time you took a test, it was always comprehensive. It was always everything you learned, you had to remember it to get to the new section. The new, it's just the way it was, so you could pass the final. Well, that's the very idea of the daily. It's repetition and enlargement. It's a continual repetition of what you have learned, and then an enlarging picture, a deeper picture, and then a repetition, and then over and over and over we go through the daily. We continually go through it constantly on our behalf, and God's always given us a deeper and deeper picture because that is the very nature of the human being. It's one of our great needs. Surely, by now, since I've been here for 13 months, it's, it's beginning to dawn on you how simple the gospel is. The gospel actually is simple. There is an obligatory covenant, a law that forms the very righteous character of God. It forms the very government of God in every single created being that's ever been in earth and outside of earth has to live by that law. We're the only ones that got away with not living by it because God sent His Son in human flesh to live that law out for us and then through repentance, through receiving by faith what Christ has done in our behalf, God has decided to accept the human race as if we have never broken that law. And to boot, He sends the Holy Spirit into our life to bring us into obedience to that law. That's the gospel in its simplest forms. It is what the Old Testament, the obligatory, the promissory, the covenant of grace, it's what it was all about. However, as simple as that is, and everything that I have ever said to you, whether you realize it or not, in 13 months has been to bring you back to one point or the other on that gospel idea, just over and over again through some different way. And as simple as it is, it's not so simple to stay orientated towards that. It's really not. You know, most pastors that I speak to, when we talk about Greek, they say, oh, yeah, I remember taking Greek way back then, and we're getting to talking. Yeah, I don't remember a thing about it. They couldn't even tell you what nominative case was anymore. 
because they forgot it. And this is one thing that Elder Kilgore said. Look, in order to keep it, you've got to use it. So use it in all your Bible studies. Use it in all your research, and you won't forget it. But with the gospel, we learn it, right? Remember, we went through the Wheel of Faith together, that series. We learned, okay, this is what righteousness was, justification. This is what conviction was and repentance and dying to self and the battle between the flesh and the spirit and we went through all that. I learned it. I got it. But somehow it's so difficult. That's why I presented it in the form of a wheel. You just got to keep going through it over and over and over. Well, I get that idea from the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a daily repetition, and we forget that. It's easy to remember, very difficult to live it out every day and wake up, oh, yeah, I need to, I need to walk through the sanctuary in my mind. You know what I mean by that. I need to walk through that sanctuary experience every single day. I need a daily experience in it because, why? Because Damon Sneed has a daily of my own, right? Christ is the daily. I have a daily. I'm a daily. A daily for what? Proclivity to sin. I have a broken nature that daily wants to manifest itself. Constantly. Without ceasing. Every time I open my mouth, there is that proclivity to say or do something that's wrong. And therefore, God understood we needed that constant repetition over and over, not just to visit and talk about it and, and do some really cool research on it and then go on to some bigger and better things. There are no bigger, bigger and better things. The daily was intended to keep me on the lookout for the leaven in my life. Right? And this is what Paul says in Romans. In Romans, the seventh chapter. great text here. He says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. To paraphrase, Paul is saying, and here's some other translations on this, sin revived. One translation says, sin came alive. Another one says, sin sprang to life. It's not like that sin wasn't there, and then I, he read the law, he looked at the law, he looked at the sanctuary, and then all of a sudden now he had sin. No, he is saying that the sanctuary, the law, the obligatory covenant, looking at the requirement of God, sin was stirred up in me. In other words, it came alive. I, I realized it was there like a snow globe. All of our little problems are down there, covered up underneath the bottom, and you see clearly everything looks beautiful in the snow globe until you shake it up. That's what the daily does. It shakes it up and you see what a mess I am. Sin revives and then we know, man, I need the daily experience. That's what Paul is trying to tell us. Morning and evening, I need the brazen altar, the laver of washing, the candelabra, the showbread and the altar of incense every day. Mentally, I need to go through my life. And I'm telling you what, here lately, I don't feel too good about myself. I said a little bit last week, and I thought more about it this week, and I don't feel too good about myself. I haven't handled myself as I should, as a pastor, as a leader. And I'm starting to think, God, what's going on? I'm... I thought I was doing pretty good. I thought I'm in a good place with God. I just got some little details I got to work out. And I'm considering why do I feel so rotten about myself? And, and then it dawned on me, uh, you are studying the sanctuary. Your sin is being stirred up. And now you can see things. It's, it's like, and I'm so happy. I'm so happy I went to... The optometrist. I can't hardly see past second or third row faces. And I got my new glasses yesterday, and I put them on, and I was like, whew. I can see Danny Bell's back there now. I don't know if that's a good thing or not from up here. But I can look down, and the words are so vibrant. And in the study of the sanctuary, I'm not just regurgitating things to y'all I found that was neat. I'm going through this experience every day that I'm writing, every day that I'm studying, every day that I'm looking. My own sin is being stirred up and I can see it clearly. And I don't feel too good about myself. I don't like myself. 
I wish that I was better, more loving, more kind, more warm, more sympathetic, more understanding, more... I mean, I just see nothing but shortcomings and weaknesses, and I don't know how y'all haven't fired me yet. But that's what this whole thing is supposed to do. And it's exactly Paul's idea in Hebrews. You know, Hebrews is written, by and large, for the daily. It's, 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 the, it's the explanation of what all that really is. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. This is what he's trying to say. Hebrews 3, verse 12 through 13. But exhort one another daily. There is that word. Wherever you see that word, Paul is making a play with it. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. All right, does that make sense? Exhort one another daily because the danger is you could become deceitfully hardened by sin. And his, his, his focal point about exhorting one another is, is right there in the, as the chapter begins, verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, consider our daily. So daily exhort one another. The word in English we would use is daily encourage one another because you have this need to constantly go to your high priest. So don't be discouraged, Damon's need, is what it's telling me. Because you have a heavenly high priest, I know that you thought you're this, and I know that you've been stirred and shaken, you have been weighed, and you have been measured recently, intently, and intensely. But be encouraged, because that's why God has given us the daily to do these things. It's God's intention to show you these things. For me, I can talk for myself. I can't talk about you. But you should know the daily is intended to stir you up. And to show you the things that God wants you to deal with. If you don't, Paul says it, there is this danger of becoming hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That danger of presumption, of thinking that I'm okay when I just keep letting all of these little things go in my life. I don't check them. I don't, I don't ever question them. I never, I just, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I keep the Sabbath. I pay my tithe. I don't, I, I give an offering even. And I don't eat unclean foods. And I believe in the truth and on and on and on. But I let all these other little things constantly go. And it's those little things that Paul says are the deceitful things that will harden you, hard boil you in sin. And he's warning us, you have a daily to prevent that from happening. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He says, this is why you can be encouraged. This is why we're to, to encourage one another. Hebrews 7, 25. Despite what you are, despite what's being stirred up, despite this constant repetition of, of you know, this guy's constantly saying, hey, the gospel is saying, look at yourself every day, all the time. But we can do that because of chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So it doesn't matter what is stirred up in you, Damon. It doesn't matter what God shows you, what he reveals, no matter what it is, how bad it is. There are things about me that I would never even tell you from this pulpit. And I tell you a lot. But he says, I can save to the what? Uttermost. I can save to the uttermost. I used to say all the time when I was younger, I live for football. Right? I live for football. I mean, I did at one time. 
I could not wait for the season to begin, which was in September. It always in mean, preseason and training camp. And, and man, I would come football day. I would on Sundays, I'd have the hot dog tray, the Dr. Pepper over here. I'd have the foods, the snacks, and I'd sit in the chair and I'd watch it all day long, Sunday, and then Sunday night football. And then I'd watch Monday night football. I'd rush home, get in the chair, and then I'd watch Thursday night football on TNT. And then I would talk about it all day long at work. And to everyone, we would discuss and expound. I lived for football. This passage says that Christ lives to make intercession. That's why I can come to him with anything, because he lives to intercede for me. He gets joy from it. He gets pleasure in it. He can do anything with me. So you've got a problem with drugs, drinking, smoking, addictions. He lives to intercede. you got a problem with pornography. You just can't seem to get rid of it, to get it out of your life. He lives for intercession. I got a problem with gossiping or talking or being critical or negative or backbiting. Man, keep coming to him because he lives to make intercession. He can say to the uttermost. It's the message of Hebrews. It's why we got a daily. Because sometimes it takes a while for that to get into your mind for you to actually begin to see. Sometimes it takes us. We're hard-headed. We don't want to see it. We're shellacked. We're hardened in a candy cane kind of picture of myself. And it takes God time to melt me down. But when he melts me down, he gets down in there. He says, come to me. I can save you. I don't care what that is. I can. I live for this kind of stuff, Damon. I live for it. No, you don't understand, Lord. I've been fighting this my whole life. I have lived. I live for guys just like you. (laughs) It's beautiful. The message of the daily is beautiful. And I'm telling you, he lives to make intercession for you. And look, Paul is clear in Hebrews 10 as he continues this idea. If we continue to let him intercede, which precludes that we have to continue to come to him. We have to have the daily experience. As we do that, he's not unclear about what then can happen. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren and sisters... Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Think about all this stuff we've been learning about. We're repenting, we're putting our sins on the veil. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, notice the play on the sanctuary language, from an evil conscience and what? Our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. He's bringing us to the labor. If you continue to let him be your high priest, if you continue to come to him and let him intercede, if you continue to let him dig around through the daily, he says, I will wash you. I will bring you to that labor and that very thing that's condemning you and convicting you and showing you how unlike me you are, Curtis Damon's need, I will turn you into that image. I will wash you with pure water. I will sprinkle you. I will help you overcome those things that you hate. Because that's the point of the daily. The point of the daily is to keep bringing you back and back and back and back to something. It's like my mother. My mother, the first time I drank alcohol, I was 13 years old. It was this horrible stuff. It was called apple brandy. I don't even think it was meant to drink. But we drank so much of it that me and my cousin, we, we got wiped out. We was only 13. And so what my mother did the next morning was sat me down in that chair, took a big glass of apple brandy and said, drink it. And what did she do the next morning? The same thing, <laughs> sat me down in that chair and said, drink it. And the next morning, until I vomited, I couldn't stand to this day if I smell any kind of hard liquor. I just can't, I get sick. <laughs> This is what the daily does. He'll keep bringing you back and bringing you back and bringing you back till you're sick of it. Until you finally say, God, deliver me. When you usually start out, it's like, yeah, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I know I shouldn't do that, God. I, I know. And then again, Lord, yeah, I'm sorry. But there will come a time where you, on your knees with tears pouring down your face, say, God, I'm sorry. Deliver me. That's what the daily does for me. It's not just to forgive me of my sins, but there's a mechanism there that can cleanse me from them. 
man. Therefore, Paul says this in verse 24, chapter 10. After he says that, after he's encouraging us to come to this great heavenly high priest because we have sinned, because we need to, to see our true selves, because we need that constant intercession, he says this in verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And we've we got to spend a little time right there. What do you think that means? Let us consider one another. Consider what about one another in light of what we just read? Consider what about Damon's need when you don't like his decisions? Consider what about Damon's need when you hear him say something that, ugh, why do you say that? Consider what? Let us consider one another and give one another a break. Because their hearts are being sprinkled. They're, they're being brought to the labor, but they are imperfect. He is imperfect. You're imperfect. I may not like what you put on Facebook, but you were imperfect when you said it. And maybe you didn't quite mean it. And if you could take it back, maybe you would. Maybe you would have said it in a more kind and loving way. But I need to consider you. You need to consider me. And what does he say? Then stir up one another with love. Man, use love because your brother is a wreck from the floor up just like you are. The daily is living proof that we are all in this same mess, one with another. And God gave me the daily because you need it daily, and that means she needs it and he needs it. So consider one another. Consider these thoughts and stir one another up to love, not condemnation, and shame and guilt. I got enough of that in my life. Well deserved, don't get me wrong. But consider one another, he says. Stir up love, and I think that the truth is, in most of my life, I was never able to consider other people because I never considered myself. I didn't know what I was, and when I found out who I was, I got a lot more patience for you. It's the only way we're going to survive the year 2020. It is the only way we're going to survive this thing. It's going to get worse. I mean, unless you, you believe that some utopia is coming and we're going to have another two, three hundred years of greatness, we're just getting through this. I mean, if the Bible's correct, if Matthew 24 is right, or Luke it is, I think, the birth pangs, whatever. All right. Yeah, if the birth pang thing is right, you don't have a really bad birth pang. I don't think women do you. And then the next couple are like really easy. I'm not an authority, but they get worse, right? <laughs> they get worse. And if this is worse, that means what's coming is going to be worse. So it means we really need to grasp this idea of consider one another, stir one another up with good works and love. And then it makes verse 25 controversial, but so important. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. What is the assembly? The antitypical assembly. The assembly, again, this is talking sanctuary language. Remember, the assembly were those in the morning and the evening worship. There was no sacrifice for sins going on during the morning and evening oblation. There was an assembly there to gather, to watch, to look, to be reminded to be encouraged, to look at the brazen altar, to look at the labor of washing and do not sin. But if you do sin during the day, go into the holy place and you got the candelabra, the showbread, and the altar of incense. The assembly was supposed to come together and look at those things. And Paul is saying, don't forsake the assembly. Come together as a church. Because it's very, very extremely important that we encourage one another. There's people that are being stirred up every day in this church. Our sins are being stirred up. We're being discouraged. We're feeling like maybe I made a mistake coming to this church. Or maybe I'm not a good enough Christian. People leave the church every day, all the time, for all kinds of reasons. And at this time of isolation in the world, when people don't have that constant encouraging at the church, it's even worse on them. 
And I'm telling you, you cannot assemble in the way that Paul is telling us to assemble and encourage one another sitting at home, eating Captain Crunch in your pajamas Sabbath morning. You can't. I, oh, I can worship the Lord and, and, and at home. Yeah, you can worship, but you can't assemble and encourage others. You can't do it. And we've been doing it for too long. Six months, five months, when does it end? When do you open up? A year later? Two years later? Never? Because tithe and offerings are up and doing well? Your brother and your people are being stirred up by Satan, by their own conscience, by the law, by problems, by issues. They need to come together and encourage one another. Amen. It has to happen. To not do that, Paul tells us, the warning of that is grave. You think about when this was written, around 56, 60 A.D. This is written during the time of Nero, when he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Written during the time of Nero, when if you got caught worshiping as a Christian, you were dead. And so Christians were worshiping in the catacombs, which was the graveyards, where dead, stinking, rotten people were. They would go and worship there because that's the only place they could go to. Think about that. They would go and worship among corpses to be with God than rather sit at home and be safe. You can't miss that point. But we got a virus out there. I get it that we got to be careful. I understand that. I'll put on a darn mask if it's what it takes to keep this church open. But there's no excuse to just sitting at home. Because what's going to happen if you continue to sit at home with your Captain Crunch in your pajamas? I'm going to tell you what will continue to happen. Paul is clear what can happen. Let's just read the next verse. Let's move right on, right on along. Verse 26. It's all connected. He's just got this beautiful message. You need the sanctuary. You need the daily. You need intercession. you got sin being stirred up. Encourage one another. Stir one another up with love and good works. Don't forsake the assembly of the saints in verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now that word sin willfully is in the present active participle. It means if we, if we continue to sin. It doesn't mean if you sin once you're out of there. It means if you continue to sin... But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. But how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? This is a direct quote from, this is a word that you only read in Daniel. The trampling of the Son of God underfoot. And counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. You got to be careful with what's going on right now. Because there is a real danger that we can trample the Son of God under our feet. That we ourselves can do away with the daily. That's why church, the assembling together, the encouraging one another. Because we're going to be stirred up and there's a lot of Adventists out there alone. And there are going to be a group of Adventists that never come back to church because they got used to being away from the assembly. They got way used to being away from the daily. They got used to not looking at things, not hearing the sermons or the words and not being stirred up. I mean, come on, this is the Sabbath, the seventh day. God meets with his people. I'm not saying he don't meet with you at home, but he meets here in a very thick way. And so there is a danger of trampling the Son of God under your feet. Now, where does he get that from? Oh, he's, a, God, he's writing right out of the sanctuary language. It's actually a quote from Daniel, the 8th chapter. Now, we're going to get into some technical stuff now. So here we're going to get into the, we've been doing the repeating. Now we're going to enlarge. And y'all bear with me because there's a lot to say. And you can take, take away from it what you can. Daniel 8, verse 9 through 13 you read it, it was part of our opening text. Now, this is all about the rise of the little horn. Without going over and going through an entire study on Daniel chapter 7, 
Theologians for the past 500 years, Protestants anyway, have pretty much agreed that this little horn power is the rise of Roman Catholicism. The rise of this Roman system of salvation. When the Roman bishop, who was just the bishop of the Roman church, and you had the bishop of the church over here, and you had bishops everywhere, they were all autonomous. But when the Roman bishop rose to supremacy in 538, Christians and authors and historians look back and go, oh, when he rose to power, he overtook all those churches, became the supremacy, the head, and enforced a new kind of way of looking at the gospel. We recognize that that is the rise of the little horn power. In Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, he describes this power and the things that he would do once he came into power. In verse 10, it says, And he grew up to the host of heaven, and he cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily. Now you're grounded in that language of the daily. The word sacrifice is supplied. It doesn't belong there. They just didn't know what to do with the daily because what most people don't understand what the daily is. You do now. So this power would oppose the daily. In verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. This is next week's sermon. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The, the day of atonement we'll talk about next week. But leading up to the day of atonement, that's going to take care of this problem with the daily, this power called the little horn attacks the daily. So what would that mean? If you know what the daily is, well, what does it mean that he attacks the daily? Us Adventists are so focused on Daniel 7.25 where, where he shall intend to change times and law and say, well, well, change the Sabbath. That's all that we focus on is he changed the Sabbath. The Catholic Church changed the day of worship and we focus on that. But we forget Daniel 8 is telling us he changed the daily, the plan of salvation. Which is much more deadly than altering with the Sabbath. Because the mechanism whereby you can come convicted and see the Sabbath is what's being taken out. Now, just for a little bit, we're going to talk about Catholic soteriology. We're going to talk about this little horn's ideas of what salvation are. So that you'll see why and how the tamid, the daily, was taken away. To a good Roman, they believe this, that... Whereas a Protestant believes that our righteousness is imputed to us, accredited to us in the heavenly sanctuary. Our high priest passes over our sin and says, you are righteous by my righteousness. A good Roman would believe that our righteousness is infused into us. When we have faith and we believe in Jesus, then God infuses into me grace. Not, not like you're thinking a belief in grace. But an infusion, a mystical infusion of grace, or some call it a mystical infusion of righteousness. Not Christ's righteousness, but just your righteousness. You are a quality of your own righteousness. It's infused into you. And then when you get that righteousness infused into you, through the earthly priesthood of men, through the sacraments, they administer, they're the high priest, they're the priesthood, they administer these sacraments that infuses the grace that allows you to do deeds that are considered meritorious for salvation. And then God can justify you based upon your works. Do you see how Daniel foresaw the daily would be thrown out? It's not Christ's righteousness imputed to you. It's not a concentration of the heavenly sanctuary where he's in the was in the holy place and then going to move to the most holy place where he ever lives as our Melchizedek high priest. It's focused on an earthly priesthood, earthly mediation. Through earthly mystical processes of infusion that allows you to do good works that God will justify you based on those good works. That's a mess. And Daniel saw that and said he's taken away the daily. He's trampling the sanctuary. He's casting it to the ground. And as Adventists, I, I, we're not in danger of that. We get that. We understand that. Look, but even John in Revelation 13 picks up on this. In Revelation 13, 
John, again, his writings are just filled with sanctuary language. And believe it or not, Revelation 13, 1 and 2 is filled full of the sanctuary idea of the daily. See if you can see it. See if you can find it there, just in the first two verses. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and the mouth like the mouth of a lion, and and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Who is he quoting? What text is he quoting? Daniel what? He's quoting Daniel 7. Daniel 7 leads right into Daniel 8. What is he saying about this beast? It was like a a lion, like a bear, like a leopard, like a dragon. It had seven heads. Later on it says it had seven heads. And it also even had an eighth, which was the same as the seventh. If we get into talking about the heads, it's these periods. It's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The beast that he's describing has pieces from all of these various kingdoms that were always rival kingdoms to the plan of salvation. It's a continuing beast. It's a continual power. It goes all the way back to Egypt that opposed when God created the first sanctuary and put it down there to show men how he was going to save. There was Egypt with their, their rival weirdo pyramid religion. That taught a different kind of daily, a perpetual daily through the through the teaching of the immortality of the soul, that, that man has natural inherent immortality within him and he is the daily man continues. And there has to be a priesthood to help you continue in in Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome and then the rise of papal Rome. And when it receives the deadly wound, it's revived in Revelation 13. That idea that this beast has always been he is the counterfeit continual he is the counterfeit daily the substitute for the true and real daily john picks up on it well and through apostolic succession of peter that daily continues in every new pope he is the interceder for man he is the one that ensures your perpetual daily eternal life it's blasphemy And John and Daniel saw it and said, be aware of that. And so as Adventists, we're like, okay, we we got that. We're going to stay far away from that just because they changed the Sabbath. I don't need nothing else, right? We're safe in in that regards. But Protestants have their own version of this. Now, this is a twist on this. This is weird and this is strange. But listen to me. I have studied these things out for a long time in my life. In the Protestant world... About the early 1900s, we had a, name by the, a, a, name, a man by the name of Alfred Whitehead. He was a philosopher. He believed in God, but he was a philosopher. And he came up with this idea of process philosophy. And let me just quote to you one of his statements to tell you what he believed. In other words, God saves and cherishes all experiences forever. And those experiences go on to change the way God interacts with the world. In this way, God is really changed by what happens in the world and the wider universe, lending the actions of finite creatures and eternal significance. He believed through a series of random evolutionary processes that just happened randomly, Whatever happened was going on in the world, that God was allowing just whatever, just turn his back and whatever happened then that, what was going on in the earth was changing God. And God was being changed by what was going on through the processes of man. Is that crazy sounding? But then process theologians picked that up and ran with it and went crazy with it. And they got this idea in their heads that through God watching, like in other words, God doesn't know what's going on. And he created the human race and he's going to let just these kind of random evolutionary processes take place in the human race and whatever happens god's like cool i didn't think of that but that's all right and so then god changes by what changes happen to us it's where we get the idea of the emergent church it's everywhere everything is emergent church in other words through a series of processes the old comes into conflict with the new and there's this big struggle and bang and whatever comes out of that is the new process And then that big thing that comes out, then it comes into contact with something new and there's all these processes and stuff. And then what comes out of that is the new thinking. 
And out of process theology comes every single modern cosmogony or the way that we view God. Liberation theologies are all rooted in process theology. Feminist theologies, environmentalist theologies, progressive liberal Christianity, postmodernism or millennial thinking on theology, the emergent church, Karl Barth's existentialism in the 20th century was considered to be the greatest of all theologians. His existential beliefs meant what is real, what is happening right now is all that matters. So there's this idea that the real daily is this. The real daily is is that daily there is the world is in a series of change and transformations and that becomes the new reality. So God isn't like this static up in the heavenly sanctuary holding to what has always been, waiting for it to come to an end. God is looking at the new exciting dynamic movements of the human race and as they change, He changes and His blessings on it. Now think about why that is so popular in modern thought today. Right? Anything goes. Gender fluidity, it's part of the process. It's part of what's real. Feminism, the, the complete backwards view that man needs to be home with the kids and the woman needs to, to take the male role, the chif- chickification of men, they call it. Men now become feminine and the, and the, fem- and the feminine woman becomes the masculine. Well, it's all okay. It's part of the new process. It's part of what's just happening, coming out there. LGBTQ? Cool, man. That's all part of what's happening. Everything is relative and subjective. This old Bible, well, yeah, that's got some good proverbial statements, but it was really written a long time ago. So now our our exegesis of the Bible is no longer grammatical, historical. Now it's contextual. Now we're going to look at it in view of common modern context and then come up with our own ideas. To prove our points. It's what they're doing out there. So what happens to old writings from the Victorian era, the 19th century? Those were for Victorians. So out they go. They can't possibly relate to us today. So we turn to modern philosophers and modern theologians. Old school hymns, oh, they were written 300 years ago. They can't possibly relate to us, so out they go and in with the new. Bible prophecy, that was for for a different version of Adventism. The beast, yeah, well, they're not the beast no more. They used to be. This is, I'm quoting what people, think tanks within our own church have said. And I'm not saying my church as a whole, as a denominational at the head. I'm saying different Theologians and speakers have come along and said, look, that was the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. They're no longer the beast. Because the new process says, hey, everything changes. Everything transforms. Everything's in flux. Everything's dynamic and moving. And so we got to accept it all. Prophecy seminars, Bible studies. No, 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 no. That was the old way. Now we're into social justice and becoming relevant to our society. Which I'm not saying those are bad ideas. There's a place for that kind of stuff. But it can't replace what our mandate and mission is. This new process of thinking, which has become the new daily, the daily transformation, the daily change within the Protestant church, it seeks to create a utopia on earth. It seeks to create a new kingdom on earth, a new kind of daily So we're doing all the same thing in the Protestant world as the Catholic church is. We're trampling on on the sanctuary, all the same, just with a different pair of shoes in Protestantism. It's still setting aside the sanctuary message in what God is doing in a very linear, moving, right down the roll fashion. Paul warns us in Hebrews 13, he warns us of these coming new philosophies. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Well, listen to this. As far as process theology goes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now that statement's in context of the sanctuary. He's the same as when Moses set it up and said, look at it and watch it. He is the same in the New Testament when he showed up and fulfilled it, and he is the same in the future waiting for its consummation. It's still the twofold ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, the message of Christ and his righteousness, the third angel's message. It is still the only thing the human race needs to focus on. 
And so he warns us then in verse 9, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Don't Look, the book of Hebrews is the gospel. Romans as well. And Galatians. And, I mean, it's everywhere. But I mean, if you really want to get into the gospel, it's the book of Hebrews. And he's saying, do not be carried away by anything that's contrary to this no matter how pleasing or how well it is. In verse 14, he says, For there we have no continuing city. There's that word daily again. We have no daily in this earth is what he's saying. I love it. There is no daily here. There is nothing in this earth that's going to continue forever. No society. Remember Daniel chapter 2. No kingdom. No political empire. No political persuasion. No political movement. Nothing on this earth can continue. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer. There's that word again. He's saying there's no daily in this earth, but let us look to our daily in heaven. That's what he's saying. Let us give him thanks and praise. It would be like what Daniel is saying and what modern philosophies are saying when the Titanic ran into the iceberg and ripped the big hole in it. And the entire crew, it would be like the entire crew ran to fix the big hole in the boat. What should they have been doing? <laughs> Getting everybody on the lifeboats. All of this stuff that's going on out in the world that we're so caught up in, all of these movements and ideas and philosophies and stuff, it's men and women trying to fix the hole in the side of the ship. Rather than looking at the message of the lifeboat, getting into the sanctuary of heaven and following your Savior through those paradigms, those stations, and getting to where we're going next week, you've got to have your sins put on that veil so that they can be cleansed. We've got to get to 1844. Adventism is the last Protestant holdout in the world. You know that? It is. It's all that stands. I know it's hard to believe, and if people listen in are not Adventists, like, oh, here they go again, but we're just telling you. Adventism is the last true Protestant holdout. God rose this church up with an everlasting gospel message revealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the three angels' message to prepare the world for the second coming. It is the final message between us and oblivion. A total takeover, a total doing away with the Tamid, with the daily, a total obliteration of the sanctuary. The only thing without Adventism, where would the world be? That message would not exist. And that's not pride or, or making some vain claim. God created a message, raised the people up to proclaim it, and these people don't want to proclaim it. That's why we need to go to the book of Jude. Tonight. Because if without the book of Jude, I'd go crazy. I don't understand what's happening. I can't quantify it. This is my message. Not that. That may be okay, but that's not our message. And we're sounding these praises of all these things. When we were told to do this one. Can you just do this one thing, guys? Please. Now, I want to begin to kind of wrap this up. Because this is just like a little tidbit. Jesus is not just my daily until this earth's history closes. Do you know that? He's not just my daily now. Or when my name is sealed into the book of heavens. We'll talk about that next week. But Hebrews says this. I just think this is so beautiful. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. Oh man. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, have been coming our high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He is our high priest for how long? How is that? Am I going to be sinning in heaven? Nope. But he is my high priest forever in this way. You remember the breastplate that had the 12 tribes of Israel on it. And when the high priest went in before God, he really came in there symbolically bearing the people he and the people were one. When God looked at the high priest, he looked at the people. He didn't, when he looked at the people, he didn't see the people's sins. He saw the high priest's purity. It's where we get the idea of Abraham's bosom. 
To be in Abraham's bosom is, is to be in the bosom. It's to have that breastplate uh, that represented the people for all the ceaseless ages of eternity. When God looks at me, he sees my high priest. There will never be a time, this is what's so wrong about the teaching of natural immortality of the soul, there will never be a time in all of the history of, the, of whatever is out there where I will ever be able to stand in my own righteousness. Ten billion, jillion years in the presence of God, God will never say, oh, look, Damon, he is a righteous soul. Nope, according to the teachings of Hebrews, I will only ever be seen as righteous as I've seen in my great high priest. Not for one nanosecond. In all of eternity, will I ever be able to say, look at me, I'm doing good. Because what will always be true is that I have righteousness and life only in Christ. Never, ever any inherent immortality within myself. In the book of Revelation, our last verse picks up on this. Revelation 21, our last verse. Again, John writing in sanctuary language. Listen to what he says in verse 3. John chapter, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Oh, man. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. That tabernacle that we keep talking about, that the one on earth was a picture of, of the real one in the heavens where Christ ascended and presented his sacrifice in the holy place. And what we're going to talk about next week as he ascended into the most holy, that very real literal place where the plan of salvation has been being worked out for 2000 years. It comes down to earth. And in verse 23, John says something very strange. He says, and the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated the Lamb as its light. And we think, well, there's never going to be no sun or no moon in heaven. That's, I think that's not true. If you remember, in the sanctuary, there was no windows. There was no natural light. There was no sunlight during the day, and there was no moonlight at night. The only light in the tabernacle was the light of the menorah. And John is simply saying, man, Jesus is our light on this earth forever. He has tabernacled. He is my daily forever on planet earth. He is the light that will shine from earth ever always. And he is the lamb ever always. So if the daily, your continual, is going to be your daily throughout all of eternity... How in the world do we think that we can live without it in this short little troubled life? How are we ever going to be there if my daily is sports? How? If your daily attention, if your daily being stirred up by your job or your money or hobbies or habits or politics, how is Christ going to ever be your daily? It's not ever going to happen. And so Paul warns us in Hebrews... Let God stir you up. Let God bring you into a true daily experience so that you can let go of all other false dailies in your life. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we see the beauty of the daily. We see why the little horn, why false Protestant philosophies, why the secular world why people want to do away with it because it's man's only hope in a sinking ship called this world. It's to look up into the daily and to let your wonderful light shine into our life and to stir us up that we may get our sins onto the veil of the temple. And in the process, Lord, have our lives sprinkled and washed at the wonderful laver. God, there is many of us here today that have been fooling around with this, in danger of becoming hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know who we are. 
You know, the brothers and sisters out there that are just like myself, that are in danger of losing eternal life because they will not and cannot or maybe don't even know how to put their mind on the daily. Father in heaven, I pray that you would break the hold that the world has on us and teach us to look to our true daily, Lord, with a laser light look. Break us, God, we pray. Heal us and wash us and cleanse us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.